Fernandez. I am a public information officer and a program manager um, for the United Nations Academic Impact, which is the initiative in the outreach division of the Department of Global Communications here at the Secretariat of the United Nations that liaises and engages with universities and colleges around the world to advance the purposes and principles of the United Nations. And this is particularly relevant in the very challenging and complex times we are all uh, living in all fronts, from the geopolitical front to the climate emergency uh, we are living. So it is today, uh, as we mark the United Nations Day around the world, it's uh, an opportunity to reflect on the values of the organization, but also, uh, and this is critically relevant for the minded of our program to explore how higher education can actually help us to spread the word about the things that we do, but also to help us do a, a better job um, and to improve and enhance our work and 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 the idea of the, of these uh, events, uh, uh, but also the the uh, the main rationale behind all the actions undertaken by the UN Academic Impact is precisely to harness the intellectual potential that lies in universities and colleges and to see how we can use our resources to, to better serve uh, the, the global efforts in, in the common uh, to, to, to the achievement of the common purposes as enshrined in the UN Charter, which is the document we are celebrating um, this morning. And with that, I will now give the floor to Robert Skinner, who is the Deputy Director of the Outreach Division here in the Department of Global Communications. Rob, over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Omar, and uh, thanks to all of you for joining. To, to the speakers, of course, we have such a distinguished group of uh, presenters with us today. It's great to see everyone on the screen who I would, who, who I can see. I can't see all everyone who's participating, but I can see all of you. So thank you. But and uh, thanks to so many of you for joining um, from really all over the world uh, to join this se this session with UN Academic Impact. Um, as we commemorate uh, UN Day, um, I think it's fair to say that this is not a particularly celebratory um, UN Day with all that's happening in the world. And as we're meeting here here today, the UN Security Council is meeting you know, downstairs from where I'm from where from where Omar, Omar and I are sitting and talking about the Middle East crisis. It's actually the monthly regularly scheduled Middle East meeting. I mean, it's been on the calendar for a while, so it's interesting to note that I, I understand there's over, over 80 speakers um, on the list of speakers for that Security Council session, and many of them are foreign ministers who have traveled in, in to be here for it as we as they try and work through um, you know, the Israel-Hamas situation, and the, the humanitarian situation in Gaza, um, and so much that's happening in, in, in that part of the world right now as we you know, we'll also work very hard to hopefully prevent the, the spread of, of the client conflict further, which I think is a great concern for everyone. And our Secretary General, Secretary General Guterres, has spoken very eloquently on the topics of, you know, trying to uh, get the humanitarian assistance into Gaza, um, trying to make sure that there isn't a, a spread of the conflict uh, to, to other parts of the region. So um, he, I believe he is actually the, he was probably speaking now because the meeting was at 10 o'clock started and he was uh, getting the meeting started. So um, I trust folks as soon as this meeting is over, we'll maybe turn to that and watch a little bit of those sessions um, today. And of course, you know, that's not the only difficult situation going on in the world. Um, you know, we have the, the ongoing war in Ukraine, um, the climate crisis, as, as Omar referenced, and, uh, you know, simmering conflicts in many parts of the world, actually, um, which is why it, it, it's so important that we're getting together um, and where academia can, academia can have such an important impact in what we're doing. I should also note that, you know, with all the, the misinformation, disinformation, and, and rhetoric, around all these crises in the world that academia has been pulled into this in, in many ways, um, whether, you know, faculty, students, others, um, you know, that are that are feeling the impacts uh, of what's happening in the world as we try and, you know, draw conclusions um, on what's happening around us and, and, and get to the truth, um, get to the science-based facts uh, and, and, the, and, and just make sure that people are understanding uh, the truth about the situations that are happening around us, um, which uh, seems to be challenging th these days and maybe more challenging than ever. Um, you know, as, as uh, with AI, social media, um, and all those new technologies really having quick impacts that we're all trying to to think about and, and manage and, and use for good, um, rather than have those that would use them for for negative negative impacts uh, control those situations. So, um, you know, with that, I, as I said, it's it, it's great that we're together today. Um, I'm very pleased that we have so many joining us again from around the world, you know, for this event um, that we're commemorating UN Day with, um, and thinking about the charter, you know, as it starts the inspiring preamble, you know, we the peoples of the United Nations and thinking about how we can bring 
all the peoples together, um, you know, in, in a positive ways to end conflict, um, make sure that human rights are upheld for all people everywhere, and of course work on sustainable development through the roadmap that we have, the framework that we have of the sustainable development goals, um, as we are a little bit uh, right around the halfway point um, of the goals and thinking about how we can get back on track, you know, for the betterment of people all over the world. And so with this event, uh, which has been titled Teaching and Researching about the United Nations, which is part of our higher education and multilateralism series of, of events that we've been doing uh, through the course of this year um, and, and making sure that we're thinking about the impact and the importance of multilateralism. You know, the UN is the universal institution where everyone has an opportunity to speak, just like so many will speak today in that Security Council session and then Thursday during the General Assembly session on the same subject um, where the 193 members will, will all get together in, in the, the universal venue of the General Assembly to, to talk about these issues. And, you know, with it, we at the, at the UN in our outreach division, we advocate for meaningful, meaningful collaborations between all sectors of society. Of course, with UNAI, it's academia, but we also work closely with civil society organizations. We're planning a civil society conference um, in advance of the summit of the future next September for, for May in Nairobi. So civil society will have a, a voice in that. Um, we think that's critical. Um, the Secretary General thinks that it's critical and has spoken about it many times. And so we want to make sure that all voices are part of that. And we know that academia will be part of that as well um, as we think about how we you know, look to that summit of the future next September and how we can start driving that change um, you know, through the mechanisms of the UN and inter international institutions and the frameworks that we've set up for, for development and taking on these big issues around the world. Um, you know, challenging times, uh, as, I, as I've said, uh, but we know that through and our collaborations with external actors, as well as the member states, we can make progress. We've seen it. Um, we just have to turn the tide and make it get it going in the right direction. And so with that, um, I will, I will uh, again, thank everyone for joining us here this morning uh, for you, you one day um, as we commemorate uh, the, the signing of the charter uh, and think about how we can all work together to drive the change and, build, and, and drive the ideals that are part of, of the UN Charter as we go forward. So thank you all again for being here. And Omar, back to you. And thank you, Omar, for, for putting this all together and doing such a great job of, of managing the UN Economic Impact Program. Thanks so much, um, Rob. And again, my appreciation to all the, the speakers who are joining us uh, today for this uh, online panel discussion. Be before we turn to them, just a very brief explanation, as already mentioned at the very beginning um, of the panel. Um, we will be, we are actually recording the session and the video will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and we will make sure to share the link um, to that. Also to flag that uh, we are having here at UN headquarters, a UN concert uh, this afternoon, which is sponsored by the permanent mission of the of Tonga uh, to the UN uh, with the theme on related to climate change. So for those of you who are around the world, you can actually watch the this event through our to the YouTube channel, not of UNAI, but of the UN of the UN as a whole. And we will be sharing the link and the program of that as well. And of course, our SG, Antonio Guterres, issued a message uh, to commemorate the UN Day. And we will also be sharing that link through the chat box. For those of you who are interested in, in, in you know, in presenting a question to our panelists, um, please use the, the chat box for that. Uh, once we hear from each one of them, um, we will have some time for Q&A and to have a, a little bit of interaction and to hear more about their thoughts. And with that, I will now give the floor to the first speaker that we have with us, which is Professor Ardi Inseis. Um, he is professor of international law at Queen's University in Canada. Uh, he's also a former member of the UN group of eminent experts on the situation of human rights in Yemen. He's also a former legal counsel and senior policy advisor at the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees, UNRWA. Um, and I have, by the way, on a personal note, the distinct privilege of being a, a, an intern for UNRWA, the liaison office here in New York. I'm not going to say how many years ago, but it was a very long, long time ago. Um, so I'm, I'm very familiar with the work, the excellent work that UNRWA does uh, in the field, particularly re relevant in these times. And he's also the author of the book, The United Nations and the Question of Palestine, which is forthcoming, if I'm not mistaken, next month um, by Cambridge University Press. And with you, Professor Imsens, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Omar, that's a, that's a very generous introduction. I should like to thank you, thank Robert, thank the uh, Academic Initiative at the United Nations for inviting me today. 
and to share uh, this panel with the esteemed guests uh, that you've also invited. Um, I must say, I come with a heavy heart for obvious reasons. You have read my profile. Um, I spent 12 years working with uh, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency. I spent four years living in Gaza City, uh, where I was posted uh, in the Commissioner General's office between 2002 and 2004, and then moved to East Jerusalem uh, for seven years. So all in all, about 12 years, 11 and a half to 12 years in occupied Palestine, with duty travel to Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, etc. Um, and I came <clears throat> with my eyes, and I'm speaking now to the younger people who might be listening, I came with my eyes and my heart full of, uh, uh, of a great deal of um, promise for the future. I believe wholeheartedly and did believe wholeheartedly and still to a certain extent in the universal mandate of the United Nations, in the promise of public international law in particular, in bringing a better world uh, for us all, um, very much so. And so um, I approached my work at the United Nations and as well academically, because while I was working at the UN in Palestine and elsewhere, I was also able uh, with the support of the organization to continue writing and publishing in, in certain areas. I came with the idea that positivist international law, that law that is created by humans uh, meant to govern uh, relations between states and non-state actors and individuals on the international plane was a worthwhile endeavor. And constantly in my practice over the course of that 12 year period um, in occupied Palestine, I was, I was constantly confronted with the limits of that belief, uh, the limits of the uh, normative force of international law, simply because of, of the incessant violations of that law daily on a people that is largely undefended, uh, living under foreign military occupation. Now, as you all know, military occupation is meant to be a temporary circumstance. They were going now going on 56 years of military occupation. Um, so subject to a regime of effectively colonialism, uh, apartheid and so on, this people were helpless and there were limits to what the United Nations could do. Humanitarian aid, very important through UNRWA, vital, but limited because it doesn't address the political problems. On the political side, there's such a divide between the parties um, and limitations on the Secretariat's part, the Secretary General's part, to constantly call for negotiations when very clearly on, on, the, on the face of things, there is one party that is overwhelmingly powerful in control of the territory, the occupying power, acting and behaving in bad faith settling that territory, colonizing it, and so on. So with every pronouncement, whether on my day-to-day -day work at UNRWA or at a very high level at the Secretary General's level, for instance, or at the Security Council, for instance, where states are engaged, with every pronouncement or affirmation or reaffirmation of public international law and its value, I was constantly confronted with the reality on the ground of the limits of this law. As a result, while I was practicing, I began to look at international law more critically, and I was exposing myself to the work of Marty Koskinyemi, whom some many of you might know, um, as well as the third world approaches to international law school of thought. We call it TWAIL. And the TWAIL school of thought, which is something that I've worked on and built on and expressed in the book that I've just produced, effectively argues the following, that international law has embedded within it um, a tension between power and apology. This is Professor Koskinyemi, in fact, not a twaler, to be sure. Um, uh, it is at one and the same time uh, presented to us as a normative force for a better world, a utopia or a utopian vision, right? But at the same time, it's also embedded in power structures that create it. So for instance, just to break it down, we know as international lawyers that the main source of the law are states. Um, states hold themselves out as open to the universal application of the norms through their practice that they produce over time. And yet we see all too often states just sort of looking the other way or evading their norms and so on. And it built in within the system of international law, you have this tension. So uh, some states, as we know, are more equal than others. And this is a matter of treaty law. All you need to do is look at the UN Charter and the P5 powers that exist. So we've embedded within the framework of public international law in a positive sense, this, in, this incongruity between power 
and a plea for a utopia. In my own work <clears throat> on the United Nations and the question of Palestine, I've, I've identified something that I call international legal subalternity. Um, the essence of which, which is a condition um, that I see replicated throughout the international system um, and the practice of international organization at the United Nations and international law. And the essence of the international legal subaltern condition is that international law is held out to the weaker peoples of the world, whether peoples or individuals, minorities, even third world states. It's relative, but to, to the weaker statuses, there are uh, individuals or uh, uh, for that international law, the goal to shift. And it is interminably, the, the promise of law is interminably withheld. And so I look at the question of Palestine and the manner in which the United Nations has managed it since 1947 to the present looking at various moments in history to demonstrate that the Palestinian people and Palestine as a place, a figurative place, but also a literal place, is an embodiment of this condition. And this condition is applicable to refugees, it's applicable to non-state actors, it's applicable to indigenous peoples and so on. It's a pattern that can replicate itself. So all this to say, to bring it back and wrap it up, because I realize I only have five minutes, probably gone over. Um, I think international law matters, and I'm certain that the United Nations is an extremely important um, venue, uh, vehicle through which a better world can be had. But all too often, we find that within the UN system, this tension exists, um, our quest for a better world through a universal application of the rule of law, including the UN Charter, is held up by states, by powerful actors, and the real question for all of us and for the future generations is to figure out a way around that, how to make the UN a better place, more attuned to and consistent with its claimed, if you like, um, role in the world, which is to save you know, succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Um, I'll stop there and happy to take questions after my colleagues present. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Inseis, uh, for, for your remarks. Uh, and now I'd like to give the floor uh, to Professor Katie Latikainen. Uh, she's a professor of political science and international relations at Adelphi University here in the U.S. Uh, she's a former member of the advisory board of the United Nations University Institute of Comparative Regional Integration Studies and of the executive committee of the International Organization Section of the International Studies Associations, ISA. And she's the co-editor of the book Group Politics in UN Multilateralism, published by Brill in 2020. Professor Latikainen, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Thanks to Robert Skinner at UNDGC, Omar Hernandez from UN Academic Impact for organizing this, fellow panelists, and to everyone attending today. It's an honor to be in your company uh, to commemorate uh, UN Day. Um, Unlike the, the previous speaker, I don't have years and years of experience working at the UN. I did have an internship there in the in the 1990s in the midst of the of the Balkan crisis at the desk at the um, Department of Political Affairs desk. But I have been researching. I've been an observer of UN politics since writing my master's thesis in the in the early 90s. And I've been teaching about the UN since I started teaching in 1997. So rough estimate about 33 years of the UN's 78 year existence. And so I've, I've been a long time observer of the UN. So I, I took sort of, I, I'd like to sort of focus on research and teaching. Uh, Delphi is a liberal arts university about 20 minutes away from, or 20 miles away from the UN. So I'm gonna take this from a little bit more of the teaching angle, but just a couple of words on, on research um, and to follow up um, on, the, on the last comments of the, of the last panelist, um, because I focus on the politics of multilateralism and politics these days often has a very um, bad reputation. Uh, zero sum politics seems to dominate the dominate the the scene both in domestic politics and and at the UN. Um, but politics is also what makes change possible. You can't have change 
without politics. And, and what I've studied over the last couple of decades is the nature of multilateral politics, which is different from bilateral diplomacy, domestic politics altogether. So, so, so we, we, what I've done in the last couple of years is really try to focus on the politics of multilateralism. And to understand politics, you have to talk to people to understand the stakes, their perceptions, their philosophies. Um, and so what we've what I've done for the last um, several decades is a lot of field research interviewing UN diplomats engaged in negotiations on a v wide variety of, of issue topics at the at the at the UN. Um, and what keeps this research from simply being reportage is that these insights are contraposed with broader theories of multilateralism and diplomacy. Doing so grounds abstract theories and enriches the, the field observations. Um, one of the first books I wrote on the UN together with Don Puchala and Roger Cote, we looked at the political fault lines across several different high profile issues negotiated at the UN. And we were interested in understanding how diplomats perceived the objectives and challenges of collectively addressing issues. And this is where multilateral politics differs from other kinds of politics. You can have, and we know this quite well in the United States, you can have very zero sum orientations in, in domestic politics. Um, but at the UN, that's not really possible when you're talking about how to craft collective responses. You have to build coalitions. Uh, and so we were looking at the kinds of understandings, collective understandings, and there are a variety of collective understandings that impede action, but also make um, action possible through through UN uh, negotiations, uh, particularly in the General Assembly and some of the affiliated organs at the Human Rights Council, for instance. So over time, we've I, we've interviewed hundreds of UN diplomats over a number of years to complete the book that looked at the political fault lines across the UN more generally. Uh, in more recent time, I've become very interested in theories of practice, particularly diplomatic practice, and I found that very productive to explore uh, the politics of multilateralism. One of the things my co-authors and I uh, started to, to realize is that in the politics of building consensus in the UN, groups become uh, critical to this process. It's not, it, although member states have permanent representation on, are there on that basis, no state, not even the strongest state, can move the system without building alliances and, and coalitions. And so once we started to look at the group dynamics involved in multilateral politics, uh, we saw that they were pervasive and unescapable. And this is what we looked at in our group, in our um, book, Group Politics um, in UN Multilateralism. We created a typology of the different kinds of groups. We looked at how intergroup dynamics unfolded in just about every uh, negotiation in the UN General Assembly and broader bodies like the Human Rights Council. Groups are differently organized in the Security Council, um, where states do emphasize their individual capacity in serving on the Security Council. But outside the Security Council, group politics matter. And this is different from most understandings of negotiations, which focus on econometric or rationalist frames of analysis that focus on individual states, their interests, and the and the and whether they win and lose in a particular outcome. So we find groups are critical to the politics of multilateralism because they're the foundation of collective action. Um, every, every UN negotiation requires building this coalition. They can be one-off coalitions, they can be regional organizations, they can be the small uh, island, uh, small island states that continue to work on climate change, but there are groups which form the basis of creating consensus on, on issues. And so that's important to understand. So, so in my research, my position on researching the UN is that it's critical to talk to those involved. Uh, for me, field work, interviewing UN diplomats who have been gracious with their scarce time has been invaluable to understand the reality of multilateralism and is quite directly a link between higher education and the, and the UN. And just a couple of words on teaching. Um, 
I, I, I want to make one remark. We are a small liberal arts university right outside New York, very uh, lucky in that regard to be quite close. And I have two sort of points to make about teaching, and it has a little bit more to do with UNDGC and academic impact than, than what, well, I'll get to the relationship first. First, I would note that the UN itself has become much more open to civil society, including higher education, from around the year 2000. The DGC's first uh, predecessor, UNDP, UNDPI, began to encourage institutions of higher education to become affiliated with the UN as part of civil society around the year 2000. You can correct me, but I think it was around then. Um, and Adelphi was one of the first uh, institutions to take advantage of that, again, being so close to the UN. Um, I was part of the team that lodged the application. And I will say that that openness to including higher education has meant that in collaboration with other civil society organizations, this has allowed students to gain access and, and be part of the UN in a way that, that was unimaginable when I was an undergraduate. Um, we've been able to bring students to, to conferences and to really engage. And I think that that is quite important when there's a lot of pessimism uh, about uh, about U the UN and multilateralism. It really, it really inspires young people. Um, so I, I think the first important point about this intersection is that there should be a great deal of, of kudos to um, UNDGC for actually taking on and UN uh, AI for, for taking on and, and helping us engage student interest in research. A second point and related to this is the sea change in the approach that the UN has taken to issues like development. I will I, I would argue that when I used to teach the UN, it was all about sort of the rules and, and the procedures. But starting with the the MDGs and now especially with the sustainable development goals, this was a revolutionary approach to collective action on critical issues, critical development issues. And, and this, this has required capacity building by all member states to pay attention to these issues. And I think higher ed has been, has been well placed to actually be part of that capacity building. Um, the SDGs have made it possible for nursing and biology students to understand how their work on the ground is related to global public policy processes. So both of these things, the UN's own institutional openness and changes in global public policy have actually contributed to institutional change here at Adelphi. And this is, this is my very last point. In 2006, we created the Levermore Global Scholars Program, which brings together students from across the university, across all majors, who complete their general education requirements by focusing on global learning and community engagement, really making that learning global acting local a reality. It uses both access and resources that the DGC offers and the framework of the SDGs to nurture creative problem solving in a variety of fields that a variety of people can, can engage in. And so in this way, I think Adelphi is working to create the next generation of civil society champions for UN multilateralism. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thanks so much for Professor Leitikainen uh, for, for your remarks and uh, my warm appreciation for your uh, good words towards our department and uh, our initiative in particular. Um, now we'll, I would like to give the floor to Professor Jan Krasno. She's a lecturer in political science at Columbia University and director uh, of the Multilateralism and International Organization Initiative at the Colin Powell Center for Policy Study at the City University of New York uh, here in the U.S. She is a former executive director of the Academic Council on the United Nations System, ACUS, and we have the distinct privilege of attending the, the conference that happens in D.C. earlier um, this year. And uh, she is also a former program officer at Parliamentarians for Global Action and author of the book the United Nations Policy and Practice, published by Line um, Reiner Publishers in 2023. Professor Krasno, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for organizing this and inviting me to join this uh, uh, really outstanding panel. 
Uh, I really appreciate the um, opportunity to speak to everybody. So um, I've been teaching courses on the UN for a long time also. I believe the first, well, even before 1996, but uh, at, at any rate, quite a long time. So over time, it, my way of teaching has evolved. And I like to combine teaching all the facts and information uh, about how the UN works and structure and the charter and uh, the different chapters of the charter, but also by telling stories uh, that, that bring things alive. And um, so a colleague of mine and I started uh, an oral history of the UN many years ago. And we uh, interviewed mostly on security issues, uh, people at the UN or different parties to either side of an issue. And then that is in the Dog Hammarskjöld Library. Uh, and the library has very generously put all of those interviews online and there are about 200. So now I have recently um, started back uh, doing more oral history interviews uh, on a number of different issues. And uh, I, I really enjoy doing it for one thing, it's, it's a lot of fun. But I think the back stories are so important. So you read the reports, you, you know, we write books on the UN, but, um, but the stories behind the scenes, what kind of intricate negotiations go on mediation, constant conflict resolution that goes on. And the oral histories can tell that kind of story. So I encourage people to access that through the Dog Commercial Library. Um, I also uh, published Kofi Annan's papers. So this is this combination of research and teaching and was able to work with Kofi Annan for a number of years. Uh, on publishing his papers because he was very keen to do it and make them publicly available because if we didn't publish them, archives would lock them up for 20 years and then you had to know what you were looking for uh, if you went to archives and asked to see things. So this made it uh, open. The Annan papers came out in book form and then later we put a number of them online. And then after that, Ban Ki-moon's office approached me and asked me, would I uh, publish his papers? So the uh, Ban Ki-moon papers are online only. We didn't do it as a book form. But to get at these papers, so Kofi Annan, you can just Google uh, Kofi Annan's papers. And then we did it through a system called JSTOR. Uh, and designed a website that can then enter you into the whole collection. And the same for Ban Ki-moon. Uh, so um, as I said, I really like to combine uh, these kinds of background stories uh, to make things come alive. And then several years ago, as a teacher, I got kind of frustrated that my students couldn't really imagine what goes on, particularly in peacekeeping, so they can read about it. So I made a documentary film called The Story of UN Peacekeeping on Certain Soil. And I believe it's on YouTube now. And uh, we took a camera team around to various operations and filmed. And then the UN was very generous in sharing uh, footage with us. And uh, we put together a, a very useful educational uh, film on the evolution of UN peacekeeping um, with different chapters. So I try to make it usable uh, for teaching. So yeah, and then I have this new book, <laughs> which I'll show, <laughs> here's my new book, the uh, uh, United Nations Policy and Practice. So I agree with all of you that policy might end up being practiced and, policy, and practice might end up being policy. So I was trying to look at both sides of, of that issue and, and putting the book together. Uh, and it covers a broad range of things. Again, it was it really, I did the book for teaching. Uh, so it is available through Lynn Reiner Publishers. And um, yeah, so I think that's it. And 
I teach international law, I teach peacekeeping, uh, I'm teaching a course now on nuclear security and non-proliferation, uh, which um, you know looks at the role that the UN has played and other regional organizations in trying to contain uh, the arsenals of nuclear weapons. And that's a very interesting process. Uh, yeah, so I'll be open to questions later on, but thank you so much for uh, offering this opportunity. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Krasno, for those uh, remarks. And uh, that connection between policy and practice actually reminded me uh, something I used to say to my students of international law in my home country in Venezuela, that treaty law eventually becomes customary law and customary law eventually becomes treaty law. And this, so uh, it was a hard concept for them to, to grasp, but I believe that uh, this we there's an uh, interesting analogy we can find in yeah. international law. Um, and with that, I will now give the floor to our next speaker, Patricia Nogueira Reinaldi. She's a professor of international relations, director of the Center of Studies and Research in International Relations and academic coordinator of the Model UN program at FACAM, Faculdade de Campinas in Brazil. Uh, she's an expert of the United Nations Harmony with Nature Knowledge Network and co-author of the book Signature Pedagogies in International Relations. Uh, Professor, uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Omar, for your kind introduction. Greetings to all participants from Brazil. So as a Brazilian scholar, I think my take here in this event should be a global south one. So for this celebration of the UN Day, I would like to, to highlight the role of Global South universities in strengthening multilateralism and also implementing the 2030 Agenda. Um, I think this take from the Global South is very important because we all know Brazil has a huge diplomatic presence in the United Nations. But even though for a Brazilian international relations student to interact with the United Nations, not to mention to create a career path in the United Nations seems so far away, so distant, so distant from their realities. So in my work at FACAM, together with my other colleagues, we try to, um, to bridge this gap between our international relations students and the United Nations. So in my work at our Center of Research and Studies in International Relations, we built a three pillar strategy to bridge this gap. So our first pillar is to empower our students so they can feel themselves as United Nations actors. Our second pillar is to make our research groups useful for the UN, so we establish partnerships with the UN Secretariat. And our third pillar is to make all the work of Brazilian universities in implementing the 2030 Agenda relevant for the process of review and follow-up of the 2030 Agenda, especially focusing on the work that we have to do in the Summit of the Future next year. So let me briefly explain a little bit about these three pillars with some examples of our experience at our center here in Brazil. So in the first pillar, we want to empower our students to feel themselves as part of the United Nations. So they can see what are the paths to advocate their different causes through the United Nations. We have done that through our model UN, FAMUN, FACAMPI Model United Nations. But FAMUN is not a regular model UN. It's not like a theater. We have organized the FAMU as a professional experience in which our students can perform the roles of member states, the UN Secretariat, and other stakeholders. So in partnership with UFUNA, the World Federation of the United Nations Associations, we transformed our Mother UN into a capacity building program in which our students can be trained to uh, perform these different professional roles so they can learn the path to influence the UN, the path to understand its decision-making process and how they can act in this particular way of taking decisions and how they can overcome the barriers that the UN itself poses to different members and different stakeholders. So after our model UN, we encourage our students to translate their simulation knowledge into practice. And then we go to the second pillar. We channel all this work in simulation into research groups. 
So our research groups later on can serve the UN Secretariat with high quality services into research and advocating. We started that with a partnership with the United Nations Harmony with Nature program, which is under the Un United Nations Department of Economic and Financial, UNDESA. And the Harmony with Nature pro uh, program in the UN is a very important one, maybe the most heterodox program in the UN because it is advocating for the rights of nature. But the program is really understaffed to, uh, to implement its huge mandate. So we partnered with this program and we are responsible for mapping all 193 member states' domestic policies on rights of nature. And we publish that in the database of the UN program. And we also created the social media for the, for the program because the program wasn't communicating with the general public. So our research group on Harmony with Nature translates that knowledge from that database into information to the general public to advance the rights of nature. Right now, the program is working on a draft modalities resolution to the creation of an Earth Assembly. It's going to be negotiated in the General Assembly next year, but the program wasn't doing an advocacy work with the permanent missions, so we assumed that role. We're now working together with the Brazilian permanent mission, with the Bolivia permanent mission at the UN, so we can inform the permanent missions on the creation of this future Earth Assembly, and we are trying to support the UN Secretariat to achieve its mandate. And to finish, our third pillar is to bring more relevance to the Brazilian universities that are doing a great job into implementing the 2030 Agenda, even though in the last four years in our country, we had a huge backlash on implementing and achieving all the 17 SDGs. So here in our city, in Campinas, we have a very important public university, which is Unicamp, the State University of Campinas. And Unicamp is among the top 200 world universities implementing the 23rd Agenda in a very interesting way. But Unicamp, this huge university, has no idea that its best practices, that the local knowledge it is producing with its initiatives can be an asset to the United Nations, can be part of the follow-up and review process to make the 23rd Agenda more relevant and to rescue the importance of this agenda. So now, with our center, we partnered with Unicamp to show them what the United Nations is, and now Omar and the UN Academic Impact is also supporting us in this process because we want this very important Brazilian university to be part of the Summit of the Future next year and to share its local knowledge to the United Nations so it can be a very important contribution to assessing the implementation of the 17 SDGs. So I'd just like to finish my intervention also on a positive note. I'd like to encourage more universities from the global south to see that it's possible to interact with the UN. There are paths to do that. So we need to empower our students from the global south and they must understand that they can act and perform as UN actors. We need to support the UN Secretariat. The UN Secretariat is more open to, to the Global South than we think. The Secretariat is a very important partner to the Global South. So we need to approach that. And Global South universities must make an effort to be part of the Summit of the Future next year, because if you want to rescue the, 20, the 23rd Agenda, we need to grasp from the knowledge that has been produced by universities from the Global South. That's it. Thank you very much. Looking forward to your questions. Muito obrigado, Professor Rinaldi, for, for your Thank remarks. That. And uh, last but not least, uh, I would like to give the floor uh, to our last uh, speakers for, for this part. And before I do that, a uh, friendly reminder to uh, the attendees to this online panel discussion. If you want to comment or do any questions, uh, to ask any questions to any of our panelists, please do so 
using the chat box. Um, with that, I will now give the floor to our last speaker for the day, uh, which is uh, Professor Basilka uh, Sansin, Professor of International Law, Head of the Department of International Law and Director of the Institute for International Law and International Relations at the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia, a member of the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council Advisory Committee and former Vice Chair of the United Nations Human Rights Committee, which uh, some of you might know is the treaty body of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, and she's also an ad hoc judge of the European Court of Human Rights and president of the Slovene branch of the International Law Association. Professor Sansin, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this kind introduction and good morning, good afternoon or good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. I'm really delighted to be able to join this uh, panel of esteemed speakers and to share some of the experiences from European continent, because we've been speaking about the Americas experiences so far and a bit of the Middle East. Now, I think what is very important to stress, and this goes for uh, teaching as well as researching multilateralism and especially the United Nations system, is that whatever is decided in the United Nations has to be translated into domestic environments not just in terms of implementing the decisions, but also literally translating it to the language that the people speak. And that is why I think, and I just wanted to show it's so important that we have done so translating the, of course, UN Charter, but also the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and a plethora for, of other UN documents. Because we sometimes forget that obviously um, UN is the most spoken language now in all UN fora. Um, English is the most spoken language in all UN fora, although there are six official languages, but there are so many more languages around the world. And if the decision makers at all levels, local, national, regional, do not understand exactly what it means, you know, because of, as we know, United Nations is full of, full of various acronyms and also um, terminus technicus that you need to explain to the people to be able to then um, follow them and put them into practice. So this is what I call domestication of international or generally, but also UN decisions more specifically. And we need to make them also accessible. And in this respect, I have to say that we have been using a lot uh, the possibility to follow the sessions of various UN orgers, your organs through UN web. Um, we've been using audiovisual library of the United Nations, which I think is a very important tool. But we've been also bringing our students to visit the headquarters of the United Nations um, mostly to Vienna, which is the closest to Slovenia, but also Geneva and New York on occasions. Then I think what is also very important is that, again, both teaching and researching, we recognize the achievements uh, of various UN organs and, and uh, bodies and systems and so on, but also to ensure that there is a constant constructive criticism going on. And I think that this is so important in all order to um, trigger innovative ideas, you know, new approaches that can be then later tried in practice. And this is why we are constantly organizing conferences, seminars, discussing various um, UN um, achievements. Um, and one of those is our biennial conference on responsibility to protect. And another is our um, also, um, not biennial, but we organize it every four to five years, conference on environmental issues. Another series of conferences that we started organizing is now artificial intelligence, uh, especially in relation to human rights, because these are the issues that everyone is now really interested in, but few of the um, general population really understand. So it's important to teach uh, both the students of our university, this would be law students, but also broader civil society uh, actors and, of course, also governmental uh, actors who attend these events, what it is, what does it really mean and how it can be implemented and learn from experiences of others, because all these events that I'm mentioning are both interdisciplinary, 
intergenerational and intercontinental, if you will. So we always try to bring together, you know, experienced experts as well as younger scholars from all continents around the globe and from different disciplines. So I think um, what is also very important is to offer the young people, the students, an opportunity, as Patricia already mentioned, to step in the shoes of diplomats um, who then work with or in the United Nations. And this is why we have started 11 years ago a model United Nations uh, conference that we are now organizing annually, again bringing together students from different countries, uh, different continents, and simulating uh, various UN organs, always on the um, topics of the day, let's say, um, and trying to see whether young people can come up with um, a different solution with, um, you know, aspects that perhaps in the real politics we could not <laughs> imagine being um, um, at the basis of a consensus of the UN membership. In addition to that, we also regularly prepare students for various moot court competitions. Um, for us, of course, the most relevant one would be the simulations of procedures before the International Court of Justice. Uh, so we bring students to the America, to the United States um, uh, JASA competition and also other uh, competitions. And then as a a reward for them also to visit the UN headquarters in New York. And this is something that motivates students to study very hard to do well at the competition because then they will meet people who work in the real UN fora and speak to them and, you know, they will have to show their competence in understanding the relevant issues. So there are various ways, I think, how you can um, empower students to really understand that they are the ones, they are the UN, essentially, not the only the politicians who adopt decisions or the, um, you know, public officials uh, who, who meet in various uh, meetings, but they are the UN. They are the ones who will make the UN succeed or fail. So with this, I will probably conclude. And I'm, of course, looking forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sansin, for your remarks and to all the panelists for, for their interventions. Uh, and now we move on to the to the Q&A part. We have slightly less than 40 minutes for that. Uh, we'll make sure to uh, uh, we do our best to to reply to the questions and 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 concerns that has been raised through the chat box. Um, I would like to start uh, with uh, one question that was uh, made by Rodrigo Chavez Fierro from the Universidad Autónoma de Querétaro in Mexico, and he's asking a very pertinent question. Actually, I used to teach international human rights law as well, and he basically just to paraphrase uh, his question. How can we teach, in the specific case of the human rights mechanisms of the UN, how can we teach them when they are so diverse, uh, so, you know, um, complicated, some with so many different functions and procedures? And I used to be myself a trainer for civil society organizations in my country, and it was difficult for them, and they have to engage or they want to engage with uh, the human rights mechanisms of the UN on various levels. But if it is hard for me to explain them about them, it is harder for them to actually do something about the information they receive and to have a meaningful engagement for for with them. So if you are a law student or international relations student or somebody who is interested uh, from the civil society side of things in how these mechanisms work. In your experience, how would you deal um, with that? What would, what, what would be your approach to, to address the treaty bodies, the special procedures, the UPR, the Human Rights Council, and the, the Security Council functions on human rights, and then the, the, the GA functions um, on, on human rights and everything in between. So how would you enable somebody who is either a student or somebody from civil society to understand better these things. I don't know who wants to pick that question. Um, perhaps would I defer that to Professor uh, Insights? Yes. I'm, I'm happy to offer a quick word. And uh, <clears throat> uh, this is the approach that I take with respect to international law generally, because it is so diffuse uh, as a discipline. Uh, it has multi uh, disciplines within it, of course. 
So the first thing you need to do is accept that it's hard work to get a lay of the land, accept that much as a student. Um, if you're dedicated to learn about it, then you'll be motivated to read and study it closely. The second thing is you have to understand the substance of it. So I spoke earlier about my desire to be crit critical of international law and my certainly my pedagogy when I teach my students, I'm always asking them to be critical about it, but not before mastering first mastering the subject matter. That is to say the doctrine, right? Um, so you need to understand what the human rights system in the United Nations, how it is structured. Um, who the actors are that run it, the difference between member states, say at the Human Rights Council, the difference between the powers of the Human Rights Council and the independent procedures, special procedures, individual academics that might serve as special rapporteurs and how all of these things work with one another. That takes time. And the only way you can learn that is to dedicate the time to reading up on it. Now, if you're lucky enough, and I would encourage you to, to seek opportunities to do this, once you or while you are learning the substance, um, or once you're complete learning the substance or reviewing it, if there's an opportunity for you to do some form of in, um, what we call uh, experiential sort of learning, right? So um, get to know a practitioner, seek through your professors opportunities to do internships at some of these human rights bodies at the United Nations, even with a, uh, an NGO that might have status at the UN in Geneva or whatever. Get your foot in the door somehow, typically through a professor or through applications processes online at some of these organizations um, and dip your toe in the water, so to speak. And only then will you be able to view in real life how it operates and it will take years for you to become a master in, in the human rights system you know, there, there are people who built whole careers around this so don't feel intimidated by this prospect feel excited about it but know that it's a slow process study the substance try and get some experience experiential uh, uh, um, experience under your belt whether through an ngo and then move on from there yeah, if I may add, Omar, um, something, I think there are not that many experts even who would really understand what advisory committee to the Human Rights Council does. So how can you then expect the students to fully understand the entire machinery of the UN human rights system? But what I think works pretty well, at least in my experience, is that um, since human rights generally is built on this asymmetrical relationship between the more powerful state, let's say, or a company that is uh, violating rights of individuals and an individual, I always try to ask the students, imagine that this is the problem, this is the right that you deem has been uh, breached. Where would you go? in the UN, try to find avenues, you know, and then they start researching and trying to find out which mechanisms there are, which ones would be competent, uh, which part of their claim they would bring to one mechanism and which part of their claims they might submit to other um, procedures. So I think this usually in practice um, for me works pretty well because, you know, when they imagine that they are lawyers uh, defending their client who is a victim of an alleged human rights violation, then they really start looking into how the system functions and see different layers of it. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, for those remarks. And I know um, some uh, of you might also would like to weigh in on, on that question, but I, to move uh, a little bit with the other questions, if I may. Um, I have uh, a question here um, about the criticism um, to the organization that is presented, particularly in the media, uh, as we witness all these um, complexities around the world and different challenges and new political tensions, and uh, to quote Professor Imsay's violations of international law that might be uh, very um, evident in, in certain uh, geographical context. So uh, on that note, somebody um, is asking, how can we teach that the role of the UN is more important than ever how can we pursue the young minds they need of it and how they can participate to take action? Um, so this is this seems like a, part a particularly relevant question given the, you know, so many uh, times during the past few days we have seen this criticism 
not only to to UN staff, but the, to the UN organization in general. Um, so I don't know if uh, Professor Krasno, would you like to wait on that? Yeah. Yes, yeah, sure, because I do get very frustrated about the coverage in the media and then the attitudes. And so what I always emphasize with my students is that um, the media likes to cover the dysfunctions <laughs> uh, because bad news sells papers uh, and, and is you know on TV. But, um, and following the Security Council right now is particularly frustrating. But uh, I point out to them all the other things that the UN is doing. There are 12 peacekeeping operations now around the world, and they work every day on some aspect of conflict resolution. Uh, the Peace Building Commission uh, has, I think, some now about 25 different countries that they are working in in, ter in terms of uh, building institutions uh, and helping countries develop a greater distribution of resources, uh, you know, to create, to create a, a fair, a more fair uh, institutions. And uh, also the, the World Food Program that is bringing food into crises, the World Health Organization that works also uh, with UNICEF and the World Food Program to go right in uh, to where there's a humanitarian crisis. And we don't Un, I get enough information about all the other things that the UN that, that the UN is doing around the world, which are extremely positive. Um, and I'm also really happy that the General Assembly is becoming more active and stepping in in many cases when the Security Council has been unable to act. We'll see in the sense of the Middle East crisis because the, the Security Council is just dithering over words and comments and everything. And let's see if the GA will step up. Uh, they're supposed to be talking about that soon. So, you know, I try to shift their attention away uh, from just looking at the Security Council and looking at all the other work and the history of all that work. So um, that's really important. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Professor Krasno, Professor uh, Lathikainen. Uh, before you jump into that question, I presume, I also have another question for you as well, which is regarding the impact of multilateral politics uh, uh, concerning the end users' actions for climate change and how do you think such politics impact the other thing and how that is influencing how you teach about that. Um, so, Professor Lathikainen, you have the floor. Thanks so much. So I just want to reiterate what Jean Krasno just said about um, the growing importance of the of the General Assembly. It's to me quite interesting that there's been this a little bit of an inversion, right, of the General Assembly and the Security Council. The Security Council seems quite deadlocked on a number of issues from Ukraine to, to the Middle East. And in the last couple of years, the General Assembly has the emergency special session on Ukraine. It's also got the transparency uh, resolution, which means that anytime a member of the Security Council uh, passes a veto, one of the P5, they uh, can be called before the General Assembly to explain why they are vetoing action. So there are interesting things that happen and they don't get covered in the media. So I share her frustration with really interesting things that happen that don't get covered. Um, and that was a really interesting question about the multilateral politics impacting the end users actions for climate change. I'm not exactly sure what the end users actions for climate change what, what's meant there. But if I think about it from a teaching perspective, um, we've heard a lot about um, Model United Nations here. We do that as, as well. But you, can, you, you don't even have to have a Model United Nations program. You can run an in-class simulation. And I do that every time I teach a course on the United Nations. We do an in-class simulation of the UN Security Council. And for the last several years, I've been doing one on climate security and the different positions on climate security, whether climate should even be an issue, which is discussed in the Security Council, or whether it should be um, 
reserved for different bodies. And, and that gets at something that, that I think Vasilka mentioned, which is that the UN system is so complicated, right? Students don't even realize that there are these kind of institutional divisions between different organizations and who owns what issue. Uh, and so how, it, how would it seem, how would it be not possible for the UN Security Council to address climate change? That's a very political issue. So for me, talking about, uh, about climate change and multilateral politics, whether you even discuss it is a in the United Nations Security Council is a political issue. It gets at different countries' perceptions of what is important, what their values are, um, and what. And it also shows it allows students to see incremental change from 2011 when it was first broached to the recurring ARIA formula meetings, which is another innovation which allows civil society actors to brief the Security Council. So there are lots of interesting things things that happen that don't get covered. And I hope I addressed that a little bit, uh, the, the second question. I'll leave it there. Thanks so much. And by the way, the ARIA formula was created by somebody from my own uh, home country, former ambassador Diego Arria uh, of Venezuela to the UN. Uh, so I'm glad to see that, that that's actually the name that was still being used. And as a I always say it's a, it was a Latino formula to 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 allow civil society voices to be heard uh, by the Security Council. Um, before I give the floor to Professor Rinaldi, uh, that probably has something to say about this as well, um, a couple of questions for you, Professor, if I may. Uh, one is was regarding a comment that was made through the chat box regarding how would you came to the conclusion that or to the assessment that. Um, there is indeed significant um, contribution by universities in Brazil uh, to the achievement of the 2030 um, agenda. And then uh, the, the, the second part would be, um, uh, how do you feel uh, that modern UN can actually shape the perception about multilateralism uh, and about how the UN works? Um, and how how language is important here and when i mean language i mean uh, to translate not from one language to the other but to translate into the mindset of a, a university student some complex term terminology and, and and procedures and proceedings that take place in uh, within the un professor rinaldi you have the floor Thank you so much, Omar. So um, for us, it's very the first step for us was to teach the teachers because we started doing Model UN for your university students, but we 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 saw that they came when while your university students with some preconceived questions about the UN. So we started also to run Model UNs for high school students. And we started to teach the teachers because all this universe from the UN, it's very difficult to grasp, especially because we have a language issue because most of the UN documents are not translated into Portuguese. And that's a major issue for most of professors, teachers and students here in Brazil. So we started to teaching the teachers so they could understand that the UN is more like a global convener than a monolithic actor per se. And that produced a very interesting change in the participants of our conference because they started to see the different levels of engagement depending on the actor you are representing. So we have our member states and they need to engage into group negotiations. I think Vasilka mentioned the question of the groups. It was so interesting because usually Mother UN in Brazil, they do not work with groups and coalitions. And that was a very interesting thing to teach them that in the UN you should work into groups. So we, difference, we differentiate political groups and regional groups and other coalitions that may emerge from different topics into different negotiations. We also started to incorporate a philosophy of consensus because usually students are so eager to vote things and to have a winner and a loser 
And that's not how the UN works. If you want to show the value of the United Nations to the general public and to students, we, we need to show the value of consensus, of reaching an agreement that probably won't be the best thing you want to have in a negotiation, but that's something that can allow collective action. And, you, and we use this expression, you can sleep on it. You have, a, you have a resolution and you can sleep after negotiating that. So this culture of consensus has been very interesting because we are replacing competition to cooperation. And that's when they really see the value of the United Nations because they understand the limitations. If you are a member state, if you are a secretariat member, or if you are an NGO, they can see the difference of power between actors. But if you teach them how to reach consensus and how it is important to have a collective, a collective decision instead of voting something where you're going to have winners and losers, that's where the value of the United Nations lies nowadays. So that's how, how we approach this issue with teachers and with our students so they can understand the value of this, organi of this organization, that it's not perfect. It has very difficulties, especially because we, we run the Security Council, the General Assembly, the Human Rights Council all together. So they see the differences in terms of negotiation. Usually people that are simulating the Security Council, they say, wow, the UN is so much about power. I couldn't find my way into the negotiations. But when they simulate the General Assembly, they feel, oh my God, I need to work with my region. If I don't work with my region, I won't have a resolution. So it's interesting to see that in different formats, you can learn the difficulties into working with the UN, but consensus gathers all students because the values of this organization is reaching consensus. Um, Professor Rinaldi, if you, if, uh, if, if you can say something very quickly about the, the issue of uh, the contribution of the universities in Brazil to the, to the SDG and why you think such contribution is significant. I think there are many things Brazilian universities are doing, especially with local communities that are not being registered, are not being reported. And now this contribution is not being show, shown to the world. And mainly because universities does not know why it's important to report their work to the United Nations and to the Brazilian government. In the last four years, the Brazilian government decided to not report any of our commitments and implementation to the 23rd Agenda for Sustainable Development. So many of our achievements are not being reported. And many universities are working with local communities, really uh, in this process of bringing the 23rd Agenda spirit to local communities. And that's this work in local communities is not getting into New York or Geneva. And that's why I think many people have this impression that Brazilian universities are not doing so much because there is this gap that is very difficult. The United Nations is too far away for, for them. And many Brazilian universities, they work with the international internalization perspective. We have many Brazilian strategies with this idea. We need to internalize, we need to bring the 23rd agenda into our universities, but they do not have an internationalization strategy. They do not have a strategy to go global and to report that to the United Nations. So that's why I think that the, the performance of Brazilian universities into implementing the 23rd Agenda is underscored in the reports of the United Nations. There are many local interesting things that are being done with the communities. For instance, in our city at Unicamp, they have a very interesting empowerment project into public universities, into very marginalized neighborhoods. And they're teaching young students that they can go to the universities because they don't think that's a space for them. They are teaching them about uh, slavery work, which is very common in this region. But that work is not being reported. So that's why I think uh, the contribution of Brazilian universities are, is, run, is underrepresented, but mainly because universities still 
don't know how to communicate that result to the United Nations. Muito obrigado, P Professor Insights. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I, I just wanted to, to compliment what uh, what Patricia and Jean and Katie and, and Basilka have been saying about the nature of the United Nations. And I think one of the most important things to do if you're if you want to get into the United Nations, if you want to engage with it uh, seriously as a scholar or otherwise as a practitioner is to appreciate what the UN actually is. It isn't a, a homogenous organization. It isn't one single thing. It is at one and the same time the sum of its parts being member states, and there are now 193 member states with two uh, non uh, uh, two states that are uh, non-member observers, the Holy See and Palestine. And at the same time, it is an independent organization, and that might be counterintuitive to you. How can it be independent on the one hand, and be the sum of its parts being made up of member states on the other? It might be counterintuitive, but it's something you must accept as a fact. And the moment you do that is then, then allows you a better appreciation for how each of the subsidiary organs of the United Nations uh, 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 work, what their mandates are, what they are in the first place. You have six subsidiary organs, right? And there are differences, some very substantial differences between how the GA, the General Assembly, operates, what it's mandated to do, what the Security Council is meant to do, what indeed the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, being the ICJ, is meant to do. And so this is just an exhortation from me to your students or to the students out there to first begin with the proposition that the UN is not black and white. It is a living, breathing tree, if you like, and it ever grows but it has these multiple, multiply differing sort of aspects to it that are counterintuitive, but operate in tandem with one another, right? Um, and then once you do that, you can appreciate what the, what the prospects of, of action can be in each of these uh, bodies. So for instance, international law, like the UN, is, 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 is not a system based on enforcement of law, not at all. It's based on state consent. It's based on states' agreement to consent to the rules that they create. And you, right from the off, if you articulate it in those terms, you can better understand both the promise of law, entry points for action, and within each of these subsidiary organs of the United Nations, say the GA, operating a secondary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security, and passing resolutions under Article 10 of the UN Charter which make it clear they can make recommendations that aren't necessarily binding, but based on state practice sometimes can be, versus using the Security Council, whose decisions, not always the resolutions, but whose decisions are binding as a matter of international law. You can appreciate that if you appreciate that international law, one step back, is a consent-based system, not something that is meant to be bludgeoned like a hammer over states' heads, uh, wielded by some states over the others. So again, appreciate the detail of how the UN has been structured, appreciate the nuance in international law, in the rules themselves, and then you will see the entry points for action, work, um, possibilities open up. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Imtred. Professor Krosno, if you may. Yeah, I wanted to say a few things about Brazil, actually, because I have lived in Brazil. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on Brazilian politics, and I take study abroad groups to Brazil. Uh, and I taught courses at, uh, at, at uh, Puki Rio. And uh, so we did put together a book of vocabulary uh, between English and Portuguese for different crazy words within the UN system. But I also wanted to bring out that Brazil holds the presidency of the Security Council this month. And uh, that has been a very complex issue in terms of trying to put language together on uh, different resolutions on really key issues. Uh, also, just in case people don't know, Brazil is always the first to speak at the UN General Assembly when it opens in September. And that started in 1946. Uh, because they were trying to figure out what country should speak first, and they wanted to be sure that it was a really, uh, 
you know, honorable country. <laughs> and they, well, I'm sorry to say, they didn't want Argentina, which starts with A. So uh, they went with Brazil and, and that position is always there. So every fall or late summer, the secretary general sends a letter to the Brazilian mission inviting them to be the first to speak. And so Brazil speaks first. Uh, but also um, with Rio Plus 20, uh, the big conference on the environment and sustainability uh, that happened in 2012, that was the birth of the uh, sustainable development goals. And that was because Ban Ki-moon had been trying to get attention to replacing the Millennium Development Goals. And that really happened when everybody came together in Rio in 2012, and it hatched these uh, you know, remarkable sustainable development goals, which were really put together in a much more democratic process because member states and civil society created the goals. The MDGs had really been created by Kofi Annan and his office. You know, a very honorable thing to do. And he started a momentum that, you know, has now uh, merged into the sustainable development goals. But Brazil has been very important in many, many different uh, aspects and, and the tre treaty development. It's always steps forward. And so um, I, I really wanted to emphasize a little bit more on Brazil's role. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Santin. Yes, I just wanted to uh, mention one more thing, which is something worth reminding of to the students as well. And that is that there is sometimes a disconnect between what the countries um, do and pledge for in the international fora, uh, so their international foreign affairs policy, and what they actually implement and what is in their domestic politics. And I think uh, it's worthwhile asking the students to look at, you know, what were the commitments made by their state in the UN and how were they implemented then domestically and demand from the domestic actors to walk the talk, you know, to bring those decisions home. And it is only us, the domestic society that can demand that from uh, the states because as you said there will be no international actor that will be supervising and monitoring what exactly the states do after they pledge to certain things internationally thanks thanks so much thanks so much professor um i would like to answer if i may some of the questions that i believe are addressed to to you and i in particular you know is a well placed to answer um one of those questions is how um, universities can contribute to the 2030 agenda and the SDGs. And I just a uh, moment ago share a couple of links to the chat box. The first one is a compilation we did and published last month uh, of uh, 25 best practices from 25 universities and colleges in 16 countries from the global south and the global north. Um, that's available on our web website and the idea, and these are uh, practices related to all the SDGs uh, or the, to the entire 2030 agenda, we will, we are planning indeed to have a second edition focused on a specific SDGs, but uh, for the purpose of this publication it's about all the SDGs at once. So we hope that this will inspire other uh, institutions to follow suit. And then the other publication uh, and the link I shared to it is a co-publication that we developed with UNESCO's Institute for Higher Education in Latin America and the Caribbean. I did the, the drafting from the UNI side and they had a team from the UNESCO side and we, we published these guidelines uh, with a step by step of how universities can be more sustainable and how they can contribute more to the SDGs. And these two publications were launched coinciding with the SDG summit that happened here at the UN headquarters uh, um, last month. Um, so these are just uh, baby steps that we're taking because as of now, there is no specific guidance to how SDGs can be implemented by university, or how the teaching, the research, and the community engagement in, in higher education can actually make a meaningful contribution to the SDGs. And we're hoping that this publication will somehow help um, in that uh, regard. We have been organizing SDGs workshops in multiple languages. We have been conducting SDG training sessions for faculty and staff of 
so far, if I'm not mistaken, uh, close to 40 universities and colleges in 21 nations around the world. Um, so these are um, some of the things that we're doing from the UNAI uh, front. Another question was about um, scholarship for students um, in Africa in particular. Actually, it is it is a, it is an interesting and very pertinent question as it is actually one of the targets within SDG uh, 4 on quality education, the provision of scholarships for university students. Uh, UNAI does not provide any financial assistance or, or scholarship as we are uh, severely understaffed and I was uh, laughing inside when Professor Rinaldi was was mentioning uh, another UN program that is not well staffed and this is a consistent problem across the UN system because of lack of funding there's there is a short staffing of course we have limitations in terms of what we can do uh, but what we, we advertise and promote uh, fellowships and Scholarship programs coming from the UN system on from all the international organizations or by the universities themselves. Um, and we certainly um, agree with the statement that there should be more to be done, particularly in nations in the global north, to help students in the global south, um, you know, to pursue tertiary education. And I always say, although strictly speaking by international human rights law, the right to higher education is not within the right to education. Uh, at least in, in very strict terms, uh, if we actually go to SDG 4 and we see the target uh, 4.3 in particular, it actually is a redefinition of the right to education that now should include as per that target the right to higher education. So access to the university should not be something for the elite, but it should be something that is open to everybody. Um, another question was from, if I'm not mistaken, a student from Niger, uh, a university student from Niger, and of course we are all familiar with, with the complicated situation in that country in the Sahel region in Africa, and he's basically asking how somebody from a university in that particular context can contribute to the SDGs or to the UN agenda. Um, we, have, we are a network of 1,612 universities and colleges in 154 nations around the world, uh, including the state of Palestine. Um, and that is to say, in many con countries uh, in which we have our member institutions, there are very complicated political situations ranging from armed conflict to political instability to governments that are not recognized by the international community, and so on and so, and so forth. So uh, it is precisely in this uh, challenging uh, context where the power of universities is most more valuable. Um, and when, when we need to stress the importance of universities, of preserving the safety of universities as infrastructure, but also to value the lives and the work of other professors, of the researchers and the, the, you know, the staff, and of course the students uh, in these institutions of higher um, education. Um, there was another question about how um, stakeholders, and I guess when they mean stakeholders is stakeholders other than member states, are involved in the UN uh, different processes. Now, as you all may know, the UN is an international organization, hence member states have the primary role to play here, and they have full access to most, if not all, of the proceedings within the UN. Having said that, the UN understood from the very beginning uh, the importance of other stakeholders, so civil society is one of them, um, um, and is enshrining the UN Charter itself. But of course, and this is to another question that was uh, made concerning who decides which NGO participates, where, where. Um, so this is ultimately, I, I, in all transparency, there, is, there are still limitations to how civil society how academia, how the private sector, how other stakeholders can participate, because again, we are composed by member states, so they have the primary role, and some member states are not necessarily fully in favor of opening the doors of the, of the organization to other actors or other stakeholders, but we as an organization, we always advocate for more engagement, more involvement. My division, the outreach division, and Rob was mentioning, uh, if I read well, that he was going to a meeting of Football for the Goals, which is an initiative that basically uses football or soccer, as it's called in the US, as a mechanism to spread the word about the SDGs and, and equality and, 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 and action for climate change and so on and so forth. 
We also engage with actors, actresses, singers, um, athletes. Uh, we, of course, engage with the media, including social media. We, we engage with the youth. In our case, we engage with the universities and colleges. So the UN understands the value of, of, of engaging with the stakeholders to advocate for the values, principles, and purposes uh, of the organization. And uh, let me see, I believe I answer all the questions that were there. Um, so we do our best from the UNAI side of things to have more voices heard. Um, you know, and I have been privileged enough I, in my other hat that, that, that I wear, I actually did wear the last week and the week before for the GA. Uh, I'm also the, the, the secretariat of the Committee on Information, which is a subsidiary body of the GA that reports to the fourth committee, uh, SPDC, uh, and I was in the SPDC uh, last week and the week before. And it was uh, interesting to see how most of the member states that, that, that took the floor uh, appreciate and value the work of academia. Actually, they mentioned academia quite, quite, quite a few times, many of those uh, diplomats. And, uh, and I hear the words of uh, Professor Rinaldi when she was mentioning, we need to teach more about consensus and how important that is in some context at the domestic level, because we could learn uh, about the importance of consensus for domestic purposes in many countries around the world, particularly in, in, in Latin America. And, um, you know, in, in this capacity of me working with the GA, I, ha I have been myself, I have facilitated the line by line review of many resolutions until midnight precisely because of the efforts being done by countries to reach consensus, uh, because they all recognize, they, they might not necessarily like it, but they all recognize the extreme value of having a consensual resolution which guarantees more effectiveness for its actual implementation. Now, um, because we're running off, out of time, I would like to give the floor to each one of you in the same order in which you, uh, we started the panel discussion. So if you have one minute or less, to some uh, final remarks, and I will start with Professor Insights. Thank you very much, Omar. Um, look, you've heard me say it, I'll say it again. Um, international law and international organization matter tremendously. Uh, the challenges that we face as, as a planet are unprecedented and leading with global climate change and the impact that's going to have on our, on our home um, here. Um, but it also includes war and peace and issues of development and uh, uh, the great disparity of power and uh, access to, uh, to, to, to essential uh, needs of life as between the global south and the global north, etc. And so these collective challenges that are placed before us need a place where we can solve them. That place is the United Nations, but make no bones about it, make no mistake about it, the UN is not perfect. We need to identify where, where its problems lie and figure out ways that are creative to work around those problems so we can work uh, towards a better goal and a better place for us all. Um, what's happening now in the Middle East, in Ukraine and other places is just a symptom of a larger problem. And uh, we need to isolate those problems and deal with them collectively, as, as uh, my colleagues have mentioned. Uh, the UN is a vital, vital place for that to, to happen. But we need to have our eyes wide open and be honest with ourselves about the limits of the United Nations so that we might be able to move forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor La Ticanen. Uh, thank you. Um, I was jumping up and down in my chair when uh, when Patricia was speaking because I agree 100% with everything that she said about consensus. You know, I, I've sometimes said that UN diplomats make the, the best politicians. One, because they actually have to respect the position of others. And secondly, because it's not zero sum. They can't win and have others lose because then everyone loses in a multilateral environment. So you have to find what is commonly shared. And I think the UN is a place that fosters that. And it does so differently. It fails frequently, but there's no other place where you 
see this consistent effort to define what is commonly and collectively held. Sometimes it feels like there's not very much that is collectively held, but given the challenges that we face in the 21st century, it's indispensable. There's no indispensable country for the UN, but the UN itself is indispensable in that process of seeking what is collectively held. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for civil society to learn from those processes and to bolster those processes. So we can all pay a part in, in that effort to build consensus to, to address the common problems that we face. Thank you so much, Professor Krasno, you had a thought. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to add that really we face a number of uh, global problems and the only way to address those is through a global solution. Uh, we, no individual country can resolve the climate change issues. One of the big problems that we often don't discuss is the gap between rich and poor. And this poverty gap uh, really leads to a tremendous amount of tension around the world. And we, we see migration happening, uh, which puts pressure everywhere. And the only way to address those things is by acting globally. We have to really resolve things in, in a multilateral way uh, in order to uh, address security issues, climate change issues, uh, financial issues and those sort of things. So bringing youth in because they're going to inherit this world and they're, they're worried about that. And so youth have to be involved, um, not just because we you know, teach them, but because they need to be engaged in, making the, in, in being involved in the decision-making process. So uh, I really, um, uh, and very I congratulate you on uh, Model UN and simulations where they get a sense of how to become engaged. So that's really very important. Thank you. So much, Professor Rinaldi. Thank you so much for this very constructive dialogue. I'd like to leave you my email and also the social network for the United Nations Harmony with Nature program. We're open to establish different partnerships with you. I saw in the chat many questions about how to select NGOs for simulation and how to engage universities into implementing the 23rd agenda. There are many solutions out there and they need to be spread. So please get in touch because I think there is room for more collaboration. And with that, we can make the United Nations actually our world, our space to convene the changes we need to tackle the crisis we're living, especially the climate crisis we're living in. Thank you, Omar, for this incredible opportunity. Very glad to be here with you today. Ricardo, uh, Professor Sansin. Yes, uh, I 100% agree with what my colleague said, but I want to really plead for one thing. During the COVID period, we have learned how useful various online platforms can be to bring into the discussions in various UN fora also perspectives and grievances of uh, representatives of communities that simply cannot afford to come to the UN headquarters. And I was very saddened where I, when I heard recently that the UN is now considering, because of uh, financial reasons, to uh, again go back to you know in-person only interactions with civil society representatives. I think this would be a very bad move. I would really plead for keeping the uh, online possibilities for uh, academia engagement with the UN mechanisms and even broaden it further to the um, those mechanisms that haven't yet started using it. So that would be my final thought. And I also wish to thank you very much for convening this meeting and to all the speakers for your very valuable insights. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor Sassi, and I will make sure to convey uh, uh, that last part of your remark to my colleagues handling engagement with civil society. As um, as uh, I would agree with that, there should be an opportunity to civil society and academia in 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 places around the world that are far away from headquarters uh, and or from Geneva or from Vienna or Nairobi to be able to engage um, with the UN. And on that note, we also advocate for multilingualism, hence why we do our best to, to do as many events as possible in all languages, not, not only English, as the vast majority of the membership of the UN Academic Impact is not in English speaking countries, but it's around the world. And as you can clearly see uh, and hear, English is not my, my native tongue, of course, but it's Spanish and, and uh, we do our best to do things in Spanish, in French, in Russian, Chinese and Arabic. Of course, there's, there's some limitation in the terms of the resources and staffing and uh, how many languages can we handle um, at once. But this is a, a, a reiteration being made by member states themselves, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, as to, to the extent of our abilities and within the history resources, we do our best to actually help. And I was glad that you showed Professor Sensi the, the documents uh, pertaining to, to the UN translated into Slovenia. And, and this is critical because we need those documents translated in, in, you know, in sign language. We need indigenous languages. We need as many languages as possible. The more the more the people know about the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and this is important this year, uh, we celebrate, and I mean, really mean the word celebrate, the 75th anniversary of such declaration in, on 10 December uh, later this year. I believe it's critical to acknowledge how we, know, we must translate uh, all the critical documents in as many languages as possible. And with that, I would like to reiterate uh, that despite the complexities of our work, this is your home, this is your house, and the UN Charter doesn't say we the governments or we the political leaders, it says we the peoples of the United Nations, and we are all the peoples of the United Nations. And when we see that the, the context doesn't seem very, very promising, it is in these times when we have to really acknowledge even more uh, the values of the Charter of the United Nations. And with that, I would like to say thank you to all our distinguished panelists that join us for today's panel discussion. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from the United Nations in New York. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias.